Well, amen. It's good to be back this evening. We thank the Lord for each one of you. Have you had a blessed day? Yes. Amen. Did we hear some great preaching this morning? Yes. We're looking forward to hearing some great preaching again tonight. And so we come ready to worship and we come praying that the Lord would speak through the mouth of his servant. Let's pray together and our worship team will come and we'll worship the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you, Father, for the word that you brought this morning through your servant. We pray again. And Father, you would fill our lungs with the breath of your Holy Spirit, that there'd be a sacrifice of praise upon our lips. And Father, we pray that you would put your word in the mouth of your servant. And God, I pray that, that Father, you would move, Father, through the preaching of your word, that we would hear from heaven, it would move our heart. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, Father, as you speak in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening, Blue Creek. Let's stand together and sing praise to our God. for his grace Praise the and Lord. his goodness Amen. and his love and his mercy and he is holy is he not Amen. so join me as we sing holy 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 unto God
you thankful that he Amen. has given us Thank you, intercession. Thank you, Jesus has given us and interceded on our behalf, going to God the Father, taking our sin on the cross so that we might know him, that we might dwell with him. So as, if you would, as we're going to this time of prayer, I would ask that you, whatever you feel comfortable doing, sitting, standing, or coming to the altar, that you would have it... Uh, conversation with God and that you if you <laughs> would just speak with him and go to him tell him the love you have for him and the, thank him for the love that he has for us let us pray God, and we thank you so much for who you are. God, thank you for the glory of your gospel and for the holiness that you show each and every day. God, thank you for sending your son on the cross to die for us. There is nothing greater that has ever been done. No work has ever been done that is so great as the work that you, Jesus, have done. And thank you for the power of salvation that brings life to a lost and dying world. And God, thank you for one day, the promise that you will come again. And oh, what a glorious day that will be. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for loving us. Thank you for all that you've done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. One day when sin was as 
black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The Word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever, one day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. The hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day, he's coming, oh, glory. those who love you. God, as our speaker comes forth bringing your message of revival, Lord, I would ask that you speak through him. 
and bless the preacher as he comes, Lord, that it would not be any of his words, not, a, not of his own, but God, that you would be speaking through him. God, thank him. Calm his nerves. And Lord, give him the power to preach your word this evening. And God, thank you so much for being who you are and for everything that you do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As you're being seated, let me go ahead and invite you to turn with me in your Bible to the Old Testament and the book of Judges. Please be finding the book of Judges, chapter 2 is where we're going to be this evening. As we open our Bibles to the book of Judges and the second chapter, I'm reminded of the story of a young preacher who got up to preach his very first Sunday at his very first church. And he didn't know what to preach on, and so he decided he would preach the same kind of sermons he had heard his pastor preaching when he was growing up as a boy. And so his first Sunday of that first church, he decided to preach against the evils of beveraged alcohol. He took for his text Proverbs 20 verse 1, which by the way, you might need to know, still says today that wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. When he got through preaching that day, a Old white-haired deacon met him out in the lobby and said, Preacher, you wouldn't have any way to know this, but this is uh, Anheuser-Busch Company. In fact, the, the, the beer distributorship is one of the largest employers in this entire part of the state. If I were you, I wouldn't preach anymore against drinking alcohol. So the young preacher got up the second Sunday, and he didn't know what to preach. He decided he'd preach about the stuff he'd heard preached about growing up as a boy. And so that second Sunday, he preached against the evils of cigarette smoking. And he took for his text 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that says that do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we should glorify God with our body. And wouldn't you know it, that white-haired deacon was waiting on him in the lobby. He said, preacher, you wouldn't necessarily have any way to know this, but not only is this alcohol country, this is tobacco country, tobacco farms everywhere. Half your Christmas bonus is going to come from selling, smoking tobacco. I wouldn't preach anymore against smoking if I were you. And so the preacher was a little confused. He got up his third Sunday, didn't know what to preach about. Decided he would preach against the stuff he'd heard preached about growing up as a boy. And so he preached that third Sunday against the evils of playing the state lottery. He took for his text 1 Timothy chapter 6 where the Bible says, The love of money is the root of all evil. And many by pursuing it have pierced themselves through with many griefs. And wouldn't you know it, a white-haired deacon was waiting on him in the lobby. Preacher, you wouldn't have any way of knowing this, but just across the state line, there's a Greyhound dog track. Why, a lot of the building fund comes from money that the deacons make on Friday and Saturday nights, putting some money on the dogs down at the Greyhound track. Don't preach anymore against gambling. And so the young preacher got up his fourth Sunday. He said, I've preached everything I know to preach against. I've preached against drinking. I've preached against smoking. I've preached against gambling. And I've been told y'all are doing all that stuff. I don't know what to preach against. And with that, the church treasurer jumped to her feet and yelled out, Preach against tithing, brother. Ain't none of them doing that. <laughs> well, I have diligently prayed for what would be the heart of God for this message tonight. I don't mind telling you that as a preacher, uh, having feet of clay, I would rather you leave this service tonight thinking that it was a good sermon and that Pastor Mike's a good preacher. But the longer that I pastor, the more that I preach, I'm more concerned about and committed to us having an encounter with Jesus Christ in the pages of His Word. So tonight from the second chapter of the book of Judges, I want us to look at the first five verses, a message that I preached just a few Sunday evenings ago. In the church where I'm blessed to pastor, we've recently started a new series going through this Old Testament book of Judges on Sunday evening and in Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, I want to speak tonight on this subject, a come to Jesus meeting. A come to Jesus meeting. Judges chapter 2, we begin our reading in verse 1, and if you are able and willing to do so, I invite you to stand to your feet to honor the public reading of the Word of God. The Bible says in Judges 2 and verse 1, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said... I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, 
I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. May God add a blessing to the reading of His Word as we take our seats all over the building tonight. In every job that I've ever had, both in secular work, what we commonly call secular work, and in vocational ministry, every job I've ever had, every job you've ever had, has some aspect of it that you really don't like doing. You wish you could take that item off your job description and give it to someone else. I've had a lot of responsibilities and duties as a pastor that I really wish that I did not have to do. But by far, one of the things that I like the least, that I dislike the most about being a pastor is confronting the people of God in their sin. The Bible says, for example, in Matthew 18, that if we see a brother by implication and application, if we were to see a brother or a sister in sin, we are to go to them privately and confront them with our knowledge of their sin. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 that if we who are spiritual, those who are leaders, those who are mature, see someone struggling or stumbling in their sin, we are to go to them in love and grace and humility and seek to restore the right fellowship with the Lord. But the reason that I don't like doing this, confronting people in their sin, is not, pastors, because I don't know the Bible tells me to do it, but it's because it rarely goes well. People rarely respond rightly and biblically. And now for those of you called to preach and pastor, you need to take note of this. You don't know right away that it didn't go well. In fact, when they leave your office or you leave their house, you'll swear up and down that the Spirit of God preceded you in that meeting, superintended that meeting, that God has been honored and God has been pleased. Nobody's ever responded biblically like that man, that woman, that couple, that teenager. But about three days later, you'll find out that they wouldn't spit in your ear if your brain was on fire. What we find here in the book of Judges is a confrontation in sin. But the one doing the confronting is not the pastor or a deacon, a Sunday school leader, a professor from the Baptist Bible College, not a Christian classmate or a Christian friend. The one doing the confronting here is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to show you that before we dive into the text tonight. If you're looking in chapter 2 and verse 1, Verse 1 in the King James says, An angel of the Lord. That is an unfortunate rendering of the Greek or the Hebrew of the Old Testament. We see over in verse 4, the Bible says, It came to pass when the angel of the Lord. Now when the Bible in the Old Testament references the angel of the Lord, it is very frequently what we would call a theophany, a Christophany and Old Testament pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now if you're not a student of the Bible, this may be new information for you. Some might even say, wait a minute, how, how do you have Jesus in the Old Testament? Well, Jesus not only existed in the Old Testament, Jesus existed before the Old Testament. Jesus is before Abraham. Jesus is even before Adam. In fact, Jesus is older than dirt. Jesus is the one who spoke the dirt into existence. Jesus is the uncreated creator of all things. You do understand Jesus did not begin to exist 
in the city of Bethlehem when he entered into the world through the womb of the Virgin Mary. But the Bible says in John chapter 1 that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. Jesus has always existed. He is from Alpha to Omega, from the first to the last, from the beginning to the end. And many times in the pages of the Old Testament, Jesus takes on the appearance and form of what the Old Testament writer simply calls an angel or the angel of the Lord. Now how do we know that this angel of the Lord is the angel of the Lord, that it's Jesus? How do we know that it's not an angel of the Lord like Gabriel or Michael? Well, that's because of what the angel claims to have said and claims to have done. Did you notice it in the text, the angel of the Lord said in verse 1, I made you go up out of Egypt. I brought you into the land that I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. This angel of the Lord, if we know nothing else, he said, I'm the one who made a promise to Abraham. I'm the one who made a promise through Moses. I'm the one who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I'm the one that brought you across the Red Sea. I'm the one that brought you across the wilderness wandering. I'm the one that brought you across the Jordan. I'm the one that brought you into this land of promise. I'm the one who's done everything for you that's ever been done good for you. I'm the one that did that and you've not listened to me. And lean in close and listen. No mere created angel would would have ever made such a claim. You may make a reference in your notes to Exodus chapter 20. That's the first rendering of the Ten Commandments. And the first one is this. You shall have no other gods before me and here's why. I'm the one that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And that same God who deserves our singular worship shows up here as the angel of the Lord and says, I've come to confront you about your sin." Now, as good Bible students, you know where we are in the sacred text. God brought Israel out of Egyptian bondage under the leadership of Moses. And because of Moses' anger, he was not God's choice to bring the nation in to the land of Canaan. God gave that assignment to Joshua. And Joshua has been leading the children of Israel through the wilderness wanderings for a period of 40 years. And now they have crossed the Jordan. They have possessed the land of of promise and God shows up now in the pages of Judges Jesus shows up to confront them about their disobedience and tonight I just want you to see this that what happens in these five verses is the same thing that happens when Jesus Christ comes to confront us about our sin now right off the bat and we're about to turn to the text if you don't know what I'm talking about with Jesus confronting you about your sin, then I would submit you have serious reason to check up on your salvation. For the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. And the scripture says if you are without that kind of chastisement, in other words, if God's never taken you to the woodshed, put his finger on some sin issue in your life and said, cut it out. Put his finger on some issue in your life where you weren't doing what you ought to be doing and he said, start doing this. If you don't know what it's like to be rebuked, whipped, corrected, and disciplined by the Lord, then the Bible says you are an illegitimate child. That's the nice way to translate what Hebrews 12 says. What do we see Jesus doing in this ancient come to Jesus meeting? Three simple things I want you to notice as we work our way back through these five verses. The first thing I want you to note with me is what I've labeled a providential compassion. A providential compassion. Providence in this context is just a synonym for God. And I want you to notice that even on this dark and direct passage of discipline, the love of God The compassion of our master is on display. Now sometimes you'll hear people say things like this. They'll say, I like the God of the New Testament better than the God of the Old Testament. Well, that's theological ignorance because there's only one God. 
And the same God that was God in the Old Testament is God in the New Testament. But, but ignorant, theologically ignorant people will say, I like the God of the Old Testament because, or of the New Testament because the, the New Testament God is full of grace and the Old Testament God is full of judgment. Well, that's somebody that doesn't understand the, the God of the New Testament. Of course, it's all the same God. He's not only a God of grace, but He's still a God of righteous wrath and holy indignation. And the God of the Old Testament is also not merely a God of wrath and anger. The God on display in the pages of the Old Testament is also a God that is slow to anger, he is full of mercy. He is quick to forgive. We don't get out of the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve sin against God and they don't come looking for God. God in His mercy, love and grace comes looking for them when they're hiding out literally in and behind the bushes. Anybody who thinks there's no mercy in the Old Testament has never read the Old Testament very carefully. And When you see Jesus come and give a harsh word of rebuke, don't rush so quickly to the harsh word and forget this simple truth. Listen to me now. There's mercy just in the fact that God came to speak to them at all. I don't know what they might have been singing at this come to Jesus meeting. But they might have been singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. For his spankings tell me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. He will put me in my place. That's one way He shows me grace. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For His spankings tell me so. I'm talking about a providential compassion. Now, His love is put on display in this text in two different ways. Watch this now. First, that He sought after them that he sought after them. The Bible says in verse 1 that an angel, the angel of the Lord, came up from Gilgal to Bochum. Jesus is the one seeking them out. I was in Ms. Williams' third grade class at the Parker Mathis Elementary School in Valdosta, Georgia when we were doing grammar one week and, and I learned that the word sought, S-O-U-G-H-T, was the past tense of the verb to seek. And it rang a bell in my mind because in our little country Pentecostal church where I was raised, we sang a song that said, Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and He bought me. That's when I first realized that the truth of the gospel is Jesus Christ is the one who seeks and saves that which was lost. Now, if you are saved tonight, it's because the one that bought you with His blood sought you by His grace. And He still seeks after us when we stray from Him. The good shepherd leaves the 99 in the safety of the fold and goes out into the dangers of the hills and the rocks and the crevices seeking after that one straying sheep that has gotten away from His loving, tender care. Jesus loves these people enough to come and find them in their disobedience and draw them back unto Himself. I'm saying there's compassion just in the fact that He sought after them. Now notice what the text says, that He came up from Gilgal to Bochum. That presents a very interesting theological question. Why did Jesus come up from Gilgal to Bochum. Why did he not come from heaven? What was he doing in Gilgal? What does Gilgal represent? Could there be a Gilgal in your life tonight? If Jesus were to come to you tonight from Gilgal, from where would he come? Well, I want to give you four very brief observations about this Old Testament place of Gilgal. And I ask you tonight, is there a Gilgal in your life? Well, first of all, Gilgal was a place where their salvation was remembered. Joshua chapter 4 tells the story of the children of Israel crossing the Jordan. And if you remember that story that they took 12 stones from, for the 12 tribes of Israel and they made a memorial stack of stones on the banks of the Jordan River. 
They knew that the day was going to come that a generation would not know, would not have heard what God did, bringing Israel out that He might bring them in. They knew nothing about the Red Sea. They knew nothing about the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. They knew nothing about the manna, or the covey of quail. They knew nothing about the water from the rock. They knew nothing about the wonderful way that God saved them from the bondage of Egypt. So they made a stack of memorial stones down by the Jordan River so that in generations to come when children said, what do those stones mean? They would tell their children about how God brought them out of bondage into a place of promise, grace, and liberty. It was a picture of salvation. By the way, do you know where that memorial stack of stones was placed? It was placed where they crossed the Jordan River at Gilgal. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. Could it be tonight that some of God's children have strayed from the Lord because in bottom line terms, we've gotten over our salvation. And we need to remember what it was like to be a doomed and damned sinner on our way to hell. You need to remember what it was like that on a, every Monday night, every Tuesday night, every Wednesday night, you weren't sitting in chapel at the Clear Creek Baptist Bible College studying the Word of God, sitting under the preaching of the Word of God. Some of you know what it's like to have the smell of cheap liquor and stinking Marlboro on your breath, chasing after the things of the world. But Jesus did something for you you could have never done for yourself. He sought you out by His grace, bought you by His power, cleansed you by His blood, saved you by His grace and you need to get back to the place where you remember what Christ did for you in salvation. For someone tonight to have a revival you've got to go back to that place where you can say I never shall forget the day when Jesus washed my sins away like the Lord calling Jacob back to Bethel back to that place of deliverance and salvation. You need to be taken back tonight to that place where your heart was hot for God. Back to that place that when the choir would sing, your tears would flow. Back to that place that when the invitation was given, you'd be the first one on your face in the altar. Back to that place when you'd get up in the morning and spend time in God's Word. Back to that place, are you listening to me? Back to that place when trouble came into your life, you didn't run to Facebook, you ran to an altar of prayer and you sought the face of Almighty God. Back to that place where your salvation is remembered and the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. Gilgal for them was a place where their salvation was remembered but also Gilgal was a place where their submission was revealed. Now I'm going to be very gracious in what I'm about to share but during the 40 years of wilderness wandering the men of Israel did not practice the covenantal sign of circumcision. We're all adults enough in this room tonight. I don't have to be any more specific than that. It was the cutting away of the flesh. It was a symbol according to the New Testament of salvation and God sanctifying us by cutting away the dead callous area of our heart and quickening us unto sensitivity and life. But for four decades in the wandering of the wilderness, Israel did not practice the act of circumcision. When they crossed the Jordan, they are encamped at a place right outside the city of Jericho. And they are about to go take on the city of Jericho, one of the greatest, most powerful and fortified cities of the ancient world. God comes to Joshua and gives him an assignment. He says, for 40 years the men of Israel have not been circumcised. I want you to circumcise all of the men. Now, I call that a place where their submission was revealed because if you're about to go do battle against one of the greatest armies of the ancient world, that's not a very smart military move. I can just imagine some of the men saying, Brother moderator, I have a point of order. I've got a question I want to ask. This doesn't seem to be very smart. We're in the shadows of the walls of Jericho. They know we're coming. They know all about the spies that have already been sent in. They, they know that we've crossed 
the Jordan River, that we are going to be sitting ducks. We're going to be vulnerable if we do that. But if you go back and read in Joshua chapter 4, listen to me, friend, that is not what they did. They said, it doesn't matter what my finite human understanding thinks. It doesn't matter what my tradition says. It doesn't matter what my intellect says. It doesn't matter what the professor said when I was seeking my degree. All that matters is you said that's what God said and we're going to do what God said to do come heaven or high water. The most important thing to them was living in submission to the commandment of God. Perhaps tonight I'm talking to somebody that needs to go back to a place where you lived in submission to what God had said even when it didn't make sense to your finite human mind. Back to a place where you used to give more faithfully but that was before you were making more money. Back to a place you used to serve more fully but that was before you had other opportunities to spend your time on Sunday mornings and Sunday night. The hymn writers used to say that there was no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. But listen to me, friend. There's no better way, no faster way to be miserable as a child of God than to distrust and disobey. And You know where the Bible says that Joshua circumcised all the men of Israel? He circumcised them all at Gilgal. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. It was a place where their salvation was remembered. Do you need to go back to that place tonight? Gilgal was a place where their submission was revealed. Gilgal was a place, thirdly, where their shame was removed. For in the cutting away of that flesh, God said, I'm going to remove their shame. I'm going to roll away the shame of Egypt. In fact, that's what the word Gilgal literally means, to roll away. God said through Joshua that with the cutting away of that flesh, I'm going to roll away the shame of Egypt. What in the world is that describing? Listen to me, I'm going to be as delicate as I can be. That was the Lord's way of saying, they look like the world. When you look at them from the outside, you can't tell any difference between my people and the people of the world. Could it be you've gotten to that place in your life? God knows I don't want to sound legalistic tonight. I don't want to try to make some some legalistic list. But if we looked at the music that you listen to and the movies that you watch, the websites that you visit, the jokes that you tell, the things that you say, the things that you wear, the places you go, the things that you drink, would we tell a dime's worth of difference between you and the uncircumcised Egyptians of the world? You'll never have revival until you get back to the place where you're willing to live distinct and separated from the world. Gilgal was a place where their shame was removed. But fourthly, I want you to consider Gilgal was the place where their sacrifices were required. I'll not take the time tonight. We don't have the time. But this section of the book of Judges actually fits in Joshua chapters 4 through 17. At the conclusion of that section of the narrative. That's where this part of Judges fits chronologically. The only reason you need to know that is because at that time the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, the ark of the covenant, the mercy seat, all of those things were situated and positioned at Gilgal. I find it instructive and I need you to listen very attentively. I find it instructive that the angel of the Lord had to come up to them from Gilgal, a place where they had been commanded to go down on a regular basis. Let me say that again. The children of Israel had been commanded to go to the tent of meeting, to go to Gilgal on a regular basis, but they're not doing that, so the angel of the Lord comes up from Gilgal to them. Like modern day Baptists who go to church about once or twice a month and act like they're doing God a favor, it could be that your days of sacrifice and service have grown cold. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. 
Tonight it could be if the Lord Jesus were to visit you from a past Gilgal of your life, He'd have to come from a Sunday school class you used to teach, from a ministry you used to perform, from a prayer closet that you used to occupy, from a place of study where you used to be. In other words, from something you used to do, but you just don't do anymore. And friends, I've come tonight to tell you that if if the Lord Jesus, by His Spirit, comes tonight to put His finger on any issue in your life, it's not because He's mad at you. It's because He loves you. Because He wants a good fellowship with you. And He loves you too much to watch you stray and to watch you disobey. I'm saying it's compassion that He sought after. But secondly, there's providential compassion in that he spoke to them. I'm still in verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal and said, and said. Now in just a moment, we're going to examine what he said. But I want you to think for just a moment about the fact that he said anything to them at all. That's mercy. Some years ago, maybe four or five, I attended a graveside service in our little town. I was not performing that funeral service, but I was there just attending. But one of the funeral directors, kind of on autopilot, he's used to seeing me at all those funeral services, he gestured to me at the end to come and greet all the members of the family. So I started making my way through the tent. I didn't know most of the people under that tent there at the cemetery, but... I extended my hand to greet one man that was there. And he very defiantly folded his arms. He looked down at my extended handshake and shook his head, no. I couldn't figure out what in the world was wrong. That's the kind of stuff that will bother a preacher. I scratched my head all the way back to my office and here's what I was thinking. That's strange. I don't know that man. He doesn't know me. I've never done anything to him. I wonder if somebody who looks like me ran off with his first wife. I don't know. He's mad at me about something, and I don't have a clue what it's about. Don't you think that's odd that somebody that I've never done anything to would not speak to me? But I'll tell you what's more amazing than that, that a holy, blameless, righteous God who does know me would speak to me. Who knows everything I've ever said and yet he'll still talk to me. Who knows everything I've ever done that he would love me enough to contend with me. That in his omniscience he even knows all the stuff that I've thought. I'm talking about wicked stuff mean stuff that I've thought, sinful stuff that I've thought and and boasted in my own pride that I was mature enough to not say it. He still knows about all of those things and He loves me enough to come and speak to me at all. Friend, before I even get to what He talked about, the fact that He would speak to us is a marvelous measure of His grace. We don't deserve for Him to say anything to us at all or to do anything with us at all. And rather than being bothered by what He says, let's get on our faces spiritually before God and thank heaven that He loves us enough to talk to us at all. Because the worst thing that God could ever do to you is nothing. Anything He ever does and anything that He ever says is grace. Friend, if later tonight, if in your life at some point a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, a mom, a dad, a Christian friend loves you enough to come and confront you in your sin, be grateful that God loves you enough to come and contend with you in your disobedience. And if He comes by your way tonight to cut you, just remember He's not an intruder coming to cut you with a sword to hurt you. He's a great physician cut you with a scalpel to help you and heal you. 
It's providential compassion. The second thing that I notice in this text, uh, I've just labeled it a practical consideration. What I mean by that is that you don't have to be a PhD in theology to understand the opening of Judges chapter 2. It's not very complicated. It's bottom shelf shoe leather Christianity. Jesus approaches them with a very practical word about something they need to consider. And it could be boiled down to this. He says, I told you some stuff to do and you hadn't done it. And I told you some stuff not to do and you've done it. And now there are going to be some consequences. Think with me first of all about the commandments they broke. Verse 2 says, I told you not to make any league with the inhabitants of the land but to throw down their altars but you have not obeyed my voice. Now this is as simple as black ink on white paper. There were commands that God had given them as they went into the promised land. God had given them prohibitions against intermingling and intermarrying. Now on this day, I always like to point out that the prohibition against intermarriage is not racial, it is religious. It's always been that way. The issue has nothing to do with the color of their skin. It has to do with the content of their heart. That's a prohibition, by the way, that survived the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says we're not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. The issue here, God said you can't go in and have close personal relationships with people who do not serve me because you think you're going to go in and have evangelistic dating, think you're going to have evangelistic marriages, oh, I'm going to lead them to Jesus. It never works that way. He said if you go in and try to do that, they're going to pull you down long before you'll ever bring them up. And he told them, don't do it, but that's exactly what they did. He said, drive them out, but they didn't do it. He said, don't intermarry. But that's what they did. And now he comes to rebuke them for the commandments that they broke. Now, I don't have time to go into all the reasons and excuses that they offered for why they did that. But listen to me, friend. There is no good reason to disobey God. There's never a good justification to obey God. They knew what God had commanded. This wasn't a revelation to them. Hey, look right here. 95% of the people who come into my office as pastor who've ruined and wrecked their life with sin knew that it was sin before they did what they did. I mean, the sin they committed is not some obscure passage from the book of Habakkuk. You don't need me to tell you that the Bible says flee fornication. You already know that. There's not a young man or a young woman in this room that needs the preacher to tell you that internet pornography is a sin against God. That's not a revelation to anyone. You married folks, you don't need me tonight to tell you the Bible still says not to commit adultery, not to lie, not to steal. And the list of commandments could go on and on and on. I'm going to do my best tonight to not give a list of commandments that may be broken in this room, starting with the preacher tonight. Because the Holy Spirit is better at putting His finger on your issue than what I could ever be. And preachers, I've discovered that when I try to make a list, there are some people in the congregation that feel singled out. There are some people who feel left out. There are some people that go, how do he know? There are other people that go, Woo, for a minute there, I thought he was talking about me. You're talking about the lying, bank robbing fornicators. I'll just simply remind you the Bible says of Christians in 1 John chapter 1 that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. What that means practically is the person in this service tonight who thinks this sermon is least about them It's probably about you more than anybody else in the room. The commandments they broke. He also says something about the consequences they bore. I'm still in verse 3. Wherefore I also said. 
Now, now, now he's getting to consequences. In other words, he said, if you obey me, I'm going to bless you. But you didn't obey me, so now he's saying, I need to remind you, that's not all that I said. Verse 3. Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be as thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. He's reminding them that they can make their choices, but they could not pick their consequences. You have never sinned against God, nor have I, that there have not been consequences to bear. And I want to say something to the young married folks in the room tonight. And for those who believe that perhaps in God's timing He would call you to be married. One of the saddest things as I have studied through the entire book of Judges, preaching, I'm still in chapter 2 in the church that I pastor. But having studied through the book of Judges, I now see that the consequences of the sins they've committed are not fully fleshed out even in their lifetime. The consequences of their sin wreak a hard, road of impact on their children and on their grandchildren. I've got lots of reasons I want to serve the Lord faithfully. But four of those reasons are named Michaela, Andrew, Sarah, and Matthew, my four children. You see, when you sin against God, if you don't repent and make that matter right, it's going to come back and bite you. And it may not bite you in the hand. It may not bite you in the leg. It may not bite you in the backside. It may come back and bite you in your kids. It may come back and bite you in your grandkids. But I will tell you this, it will bring consequences. That relationship that you're in that doesn't honor God, it's going to bring consequences. That alcohol that you have in the fridge you think nobody knows about, you may never get caught by anybody but God. It's going to have consequences. You've never committed a sin against God and not brought consequences into your life. And Jesus shows up to tell them, you need to think about this practically. There's a providential compassion. There's a practical consideration. The third and final thing I want you to see in this text is a personal confession. You see, the good news of the gospel is whenever there's a confrontation, there can be a confession. Whenever there's a rebuke, there can always be repentance. And although their confession and repentance seems to be short-lived, if you look at the balance of the book of Judges, at least they get it right in this moment. And everything that I've been talking about and preaching about for the last 30 minutes, however long we've been preaching, has been driving up to this point. Everything up to this point has been the introduction. So if anybody asks you, how long did Brother Mike preach tonight? It was a fairly short sermon, but I had a long introduction. What does our response look like when we give a biblical, personal confession of our sin? I think there are two things that we notice in this text and we'll be finished. First, there is weeping and repentance. Verse 4, And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voice and wept and they called the name of that place Bochum. That word Bochum is an interesting word. It's, a, it's in the plural uh, form of the word in the Hebrew language. And it, we would translate it like this. It means that place where we all wept. The place had a different name prior to that. But watch this. After the angel of the Lord, after Jesus confronted them in their sin, they are on their faces, broken and weeping before God, so much so that the name of that place was renamed that place where we wept that night. There's weeping. Now when you preach and teach the Bible, you've got to be very careful to not teach about what the Bible does not say, but sometimes it's instructive to note what the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say that when the angel of the Lord finished speaking these words that they balked. 
that they protested, that they defended themselves. The Bible does not say that they said, Lord, you've got the wrong people. We may have done some things wrong, but we're not nearly as bad as the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Jebusites. They did not call the angel of the Lord a fundamentalist. They did not call the angel of the Lord a narrow-minded, backwood, bigoted, legalistic preacher. They did not say to the angel of the Lord, Judge not, lest she be judged. And they did not say to the angel of the Lord, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. By the way, that's not anything you ever want to say to Jesus. They didn't point their finger at anybody else. They didn't say, who are you to come and rebuke me? They didn't say, I know about some junk in your life too. You're no worse than me. I'm no worse than you. You, 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 you don't have any business coming to confront me. No, when the angel of the Lord confronted them in their sin, they are on their face broken. Not ticked off. Not mad. Not subtweeting on Twitter. They're at an altar of prayer getting right with God. Now this statement is not on the screen, but you ought to write this down on your heart. Mature believers do not point a finger back at the one confronting them in their sin. These people are weeping in repentance. Now, one thing that I want to point out, see it, and you can hear it. Could I ask you tonight, when was the last time you were so broken over your sin that you wept before God? Again, I don't think you've got to come and make a big show up here at a public altar, but I will tell you what bothers me. And it bothers me sometimes because I hear these words come out of my own mouth. By the way, nobody's sin should bother you more than yours. But it bothers me when I hear people say stuff like this. Father, thank you for this food you've provided, the hands that have prepared it. And if we've done anything wrong today, forgive us of our many sins in Jesus' name. If you've done anything wrong today, I want you to imagine that I get in an argument with my wife. Now, I try not to argue with my wife because she's a better shot with a deer rifle than I am. I try to keep her happy for a lot of different reasons. But I want you to imagine that one morning I get up and I'm in a foul mood. And I say something unkind. I call her a name. I tell her she's just like her mama in the worst kind of way. I slam the door and stomp out on the way to the office. Then when I come home at 5 o'clock, I can tell that there's an icy chill in the atmosphere. All the married men say, "Uh uh-huh. I mean, I can just tell something's wrong. And imagine I walk up to her and I say, what's wrong, honey? And what do you think she's going to say? Because it's the biggest lie that women tell. She's going to say, nothing. Nothing. And imagine I say, well, honey... If I've done anything wrong today, forgive me. Do you know what my sweet wife is going to say? If, if, did you really stand here and say if, after what you said about me, after the name you called me, after what you said about my mother, after what you said about my father, after you stomped out the foyer, slammed the door, drop kicked my cat, (laughs) kicked the dog, acted like a horse is behind in front of the children, are you really going to walk back in this house tonight and say, if I've done anything wrong, forgive me? Brothers and sisters, I tell you, that pales in comparison 
to the lives we often live in the face of a holy, righteous, blameless God. And we dare often come to a place of prayer and say, Father, forgive me for my many sins if I've done anything wrong. May God give us some people who'll say, Lord, I'm broken because I said that thing. God, I'm broken because I did that thing. Father, I'm coming to you and I'm asking you, I'm begging you to forgive me because I said that. I did that. I looked at that. This is the stuff right here that I've done. And God, I'm broken over my sin. When genuine confession comes, there will be weeping and repentance. When genuine confession comes, there will be worship and reverence. Verse 5 concludes, they called the name of that place Bochum and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. They built an altar and they sacrificed to the Lord. The bottom line is they got right with God. I love the story that's told of two young men that were sitting in a revival service preacher preached about Christians getting right with God. One old boy, he was the first one down the aisle, came to the altar, tears streaming down his face, came to the altar and prayed and quoted 1 John 1, 9. Somebody needs to hear this tonight, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, I haven't been faithful to Him. I'm glad my forgiveness isn't based on my faithfulness, but He is faithful. And he's just to cleanse and forgive. That old boy left the back row, came down. Man, he prayed some of those verses over his life and found the wonderful forgiveness of God. Went back to his seat. Back on that back row, he'd been standing there with one of his buddies and they'd gotten away from the Lord together. Running the roads on Friday, Saturday night, drinking and carousing, just wild, loose living. One of them had just gotten right with the Lord. He elbowed his buddy. He said, hey, don't you want to go get right with God? I just got right with God. It feels so good. Don't you want to go up to the front and get right with God? He said, well, I want to get right with God, but Mama's in the choir. If I go up front, Mama may suspect some of the stuff that I've been doing. Can I get right with God here on the back row? He said, no, you can't get right with God on the back row. You can only get right with God if you go to the front. choir sang a little while longer. Tears were pouring down his face. His buddy elbowed him again and said, Man, I'll go forward with you. Don't you want to go up to the front and get right with God? He said, No, Mama's in the choir. Daddy is an altar counselor. They may hook me up with Daddy and I have to tell him all this stuff that I've been doing. I'll be in so much trouble. Can't I just get right with God here on the back row? He said, No, you can't get right with God on the back row. You've got to go all the way up to the front if you want to get right with God. The choir sang a little while longer. Tears began to flow down that old boy's face. Finally, he elbowed his brother, elbowed his friend, said, let me out in the aisle. I don't care what mama finds out about. I don't care what daddy knows about. I've got to get right with God. That's when his friend said, now you can get right with God on the back row. I tell you that story just to say I've been preaching long enough to know how to milk an invitation. I know how to get people to come to an altar. Raise your hand if you love your mama and like apple pie and if you raised your hand come to the altar. That's not what I'm interested in tonight. Because the real test of revival is not how quickly you can walk this way but how do we walk when we go out that way. Having said that, there is something special about finding a public place of prayer, a place like this, or to turn your seat into a place to do business with God. I intentionally mislabeled tonight's message. I called it a come to Jesus meeting because that's a phrase we use when somebody rings our bell and gets in our business. They had a come to Jesus meeting. But the reality is this is not a come to Jesus meeting. This is a Jesus come to you meeting. And where I come from, when somebody loves us enough to come talk to us, the polite thing to do is have a conversation with them.
our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed all across this room tonight just to remove distraction. I want to ask you tonight, has the Spirit of God dealt with you about any issue in your life? It may be something I named. It may be something just the Holy Spirit has named to you. I regularly ask my church to pray this simple prayer. Listen to it. Lord, show me me. David prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, O God, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. As you pray and ask God to reveal you to you, if any of that is not pleasing to the Lord, repent of it. Turn from it and commit to walk with the Lord. Father, you are better able to oversee the time of invitation and decision than I could ever be. So by your good grace and power, do your work in the life of every man and woman in this room tonight. That our lives would be clean and pure before you and before our fellow man. Not so that people would say, what a great Christian. But so that our lives would point to a great Savior named Jesus. Move now in this time of commitment. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you quietly stand to your feet? Perhaps you want to come and find a place of public prayer or just sit back down and turn the back of that pew in front of you into a place to do business with the Lord. Our brother's going to be playing, I have decided to follow Jesus. And just in the quietness of this moment, if you need to do business with the Lord, you go ahead and do so. You lift your voice. Let's just sing this commitment together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. turning back no turning back I want you to do something as the altar remains open if there is some act some area of your life that the Lord has convicted you about boy he has me tonight I want you to think about that thing whatever that is as you make this commitment think about that thing and sing your commitment again. I have decided to follow Jesus. Whatever it is, Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to 
follow Jesus. Amen. It's been good to be here tonight. Today we thank God for our brother and for the word that the Lord has brought through him. One more session tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. You come praying, expecting God to speak and to move, and we'll watch what only God can do. Amen? Amen. All right, let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for this day, the privilege to be here. Pray your blessings on each one. As they depart, we pray for safe travels. May you bring us back, Lord, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., filling our lungs with the breath of your spirit that we can worship your name and hear from your word. Lord, may you be honored as we commit our lives and surrender our wills to you. In Jesus' name, amen.